Today we're going to introduce the topic of networks. First thing I'm going to ask you to do is just to see if you can name these devices. I'll pause, we can pause the video. Okay, on the left hand side you have your sort of home router. The middle is a server, so a stack of lots and lots of sort of computer components. On the right we have what's referred to as transmission media, in particular an ethernet cable. So specification content, we're looking at what LANs and WANs are, factors that affect the performance of a network, as well as the different roles of computers in a client, server, and peer-to-peer -peer network. In particular, we want to pay close attention to the characteristics of LANs and WANs, and some examples of each. We want to understand the different factors that can affect the performance of the network, such as the number of devices connected and bandwidth, and we'll look at some others as well. So first of all, it's worth identifying what a network is. So a network essentially is just a number of computer systems that are connected together, enabling them to be able to communicate and share resources with each other. Now these devices that are connected together may not just be your traditional desktop computers. We're talking about things like mobile phone, games consoles, tablets, and all those sorts of internet connected devices. A LAN then, a local area network. Now, the, ne the clue is in the name, local. So it's a, a network that spans over a small geographical area. Now, when we're saying about a small geographical area, we're typically talking about a single building. So for example, your home. You would have a LAN at your home, which is your home network where all your device is connected. You might, for example, think about our classroom at school where the 30 old computers in the classroom are all connected together to a single point. You might refer to that as a LAN. With a LAN, with a local area network, there are some key things to consider. So firstly, the person who owns the network is responsible for all of the hardware. So at home, if your network goes down, it's down to you to sort it out. Now, the likelihood is that your internet provider will give you some support. But if it were a case that you were running your own network with your own cabling and so forth, and one of those cables gets broken, it's a case that it's down to you to replace that cable. With a WAN, a wide area network, there are some other considerations. Now with a wide area network, the difference is it's over a larger geographical area, such as several buildings, a town, a city, or perhaps even up to an international level. Now with a WAN, the infrastructure, so all of the hardware that exists for that network, isn't owned or controlled by necessarily the people using it. So when you think about using a WAN, so the internet is the biggest sort of example of a WAN, you don't own the servers, you don't own the networks that you're using, you're simply just using them um, and you're reliant on someone else to maintain them. So sometimes you'll notice that servers go down and there's nothing you can do about it. You haven't got the abilities to correct or fix any of those issues. So it is a case that you are not responsible for that infrastructure. So there are a few things that affect the performance of a network. One of the most obvious ones is the number of devices. You may have experienced this when you're using your home network. So if it's the case, for example, there are several people on the home network at the same time doing some quite intensive things that are using a lot of network data, you might find your network will begin to slow and you'll see that your transfer speeds could drop. So for example, if it were a case that you had four or five people streaming high quality video at the same time on your home network, you might notice some buffering issues or some de degradation in the quality of the video that you're trying to stream. And this is true for any sort of scale of network. So if you think about the school network, for example, if all the computers run at the same time streaming content, then this is gonna impact the performance quite significantly. Another consideration is bandwidth. Now bandwidth is the measure of the maximum capacity of data that could be transferred at any given time. So you might hear in uh, internet speeds of saying 50 or 100 megabytes per second, and that is a maximum amount of data that can be transferred. So if, for example, you're playing your games console and that's using 20 megabits per second and then someone else is streaming on netflix and that's using 20 megabits per second and you've only got 50 megabits bandwidth you might find that if you wanted to do some additional stuff on the uh, internet at that time that your speeds can be impacted and slowed across all of the devices depending on priorities that are given so bandwidth is more about how much data at any given time can transfer through your network there are a couple of other things to consider. So interference is another one. So interference may well be in the form of other Wi-Fi networks that are broadcast on similar frequencies to the one that you're using. Equally, it might be something as simple as physical objects that actually obstruct your Wi-Fi from working. <clears throat> so if you think about it at home, again, your router that sends out your Wi-Fi signal may well be located somewhere downstairs in your house. But if you're using your internet upstairs in your house, you might find the signal to be quite weak and in turn, impact the performance of the network. There are solutions for that, such as 
range extenders and power line adapters and so forth. But typically, um, interference exists and it's a case of being aware that how that can impact your Wi-Fi. And distance as well. And this is where obviously distance can be an issue. So we spoke about interferences in having things in between yourself and the wireless, uh, uh, wireless box. Equally distance in itself. So in a scenario where there weren't any objects in the way of uh, direct communication, you will still find that distance will have a part to play in terms of the quality of your connection. So again, the further away you are, the weaker the signal and therefore the slower the performance of the network. So there are a few key terms when we think about client, server and peer-to-peer -peer networks. So a client is in essence, a device that's capable of obtaining, obtaining information from a server. So you can think of your desktop computers as a client. The server is that super powerful computer where everything is stored centrally and can be obtained by the clients. A peer, again, is you can think of your desktop uh, computer could be access, act as a peer, but again, in a different structure. And I'm gonna use these terms over the next couple of slides just to, uh, so just want to introduce them. Now in a client server model for a network, this is where we have our main clients. So think of them, like I said, as your desktop computers with a centralized server where all the data and information is stored. So if you think about in school, you can log in at any computer, at any classroom, and access a centralized storage of all of your files. So for example, the Google Drive is stored on a server somewhere, and you access that remotely from any one of your devices. There are some considerations. So this network relies on a central server, and all clients request services from that central server, be it for file storage, printing, emails, or anything like that. And it's also worthwhile noting that this can come at quite a cost. Servers aren't cheap. Therefore, it could be reasonably expensive to have this sort of network being set up. So we need to make sure that we've got those high end powerful servers to manage the fact that you might have hundreds, if not thousands of computers requesting data at the same time. In a peer to peer model, all the computers are equal. So in a peer to peer model, you have lots and lots of desktop computers which have equal status. There's no central point of communication. There isn't a point of which one machine has more uh, importance than another. One of the other things to consider as well is the fact that when you want to access something on a peer-to-peer -peer network, you need to make sure that you're accessing it from the machine that it's saved on. So when you save your files, you save your programs or anything like that, they don't get stored in a central server. They get stored on the actual machine that you're using. This means that if you change machine at any point, you won't necessarily be able to access the data that is on that machine unless it's switched on and enabling sharing. One of the considerations with this type of network is it is reasonably or comparatively cheap to set up. And there's no additional sort of central servers or anything like that needed. You can set up a peer-to-peer -peer network just simply with two or more computers and some simple ethernet cables or Wi-Fi. This table here, I would pause on this point and give you a chance to read. It goes